news to ignite the fire for a brand new hashtag film fridays here on the channel you'll notice that this isn't the video i've been hyped up for the last few film friday sessions and that's purely because the video revolving around the deluxe trilogy review has been scrapped officially due to the fact that i've been working on the video for months and it just hasn't got into a state where i'm proud of it it's not a great video so i just decided in the long term that it's best to just scrap the video in its entirety and instead we're here with the ultimate how to train your dragon discussion compilation so what this is is that when i used to have a how to train your dragon playlist on the channel i had scattered throughout the entire thing a bunch of different discussion topics and so what this video is going to do is it's going to take those discussion topics and compile them all into one major video that way when i get all of the thumbnail sorted for my previous how to train your dragon videos i can put them all back into a neat little playlist and this will be the 18th video within that playlist compiling eight different discussion videos that were previously as i mentioned scattered randomly throughout that playlist so i am very happy to be returning to how train a dragon at long last that watermark has been uh, kind of just sitting there in my archives for ages so it's about damn time i got to use it again and i'm really looking forward to talking about how train a dragon again or at least looking into the past to see how it was that i used to talk about how train a dragon now obviously all of these discussion topics have been placed into chapters so you can find the timestamps for those in the description below but ultimately these are just uh, videos from the past of the channel discussing the How Train Dragon uh, franchise in its entirety. So the discussion compilation is going to start with the very reasons as to why I love the How Train Dragon franchise in the first place. Then we're going to move along to fixing my problems with the hidden world. Then we're going to look at my favourite scene from every How Train Dragon movie. Then we're going to talk about what I would like to see from the future of this franchise. Then we're going to talk about my favourite dragon introduced in each of the films. Then we're going to talk about a dozen species which I wish were introduced in the movies. Then we're going to talk about my love-hate relationship with How to Train Dragon 2. Yeah, it's a very interesting discussion topic, that one. In fact, all of these are. But we're not going to end there because we're also going to talk about what each How to Train Your Dragon film does best. And we're going to end things off with answering the question, are the How Train Your Dragon movies modern classics? So again, you can find uh, the chapters and the timestamps for all of those discussion topics in the description below. But that being said, this is going to be one hell of a film Friday because it's a compilation of all of these interesting discussion topics. So that being said, let's roll the intro and get straight into the compilation without further ado. Today's video is pretty hard because it's currently June 11th, which means that this came in the mail yesterday. <laughs> I'm not even going to spend any time explaining what this is because I just cannot wait to get into this. So you guys remember how hyped I was to watch How to Train Your Dragon 3 in cinemas? Well, this moment is just as hyped as that because instead of me getting to watch a film at cinemas, I've instead got the Blu-ray to watch the film at home. And I tell you what, the home experience sometimes can be much better than cinema because it's much more private, much more personal experience for me. And oh my gosh, would really you look at that. So this is the limited edition release. We get like the Funko Pop, like keyring thing with dinguses. And then of course, on top of that, we also get the whole limited edition box. To be fair, I bought this limited edition just for the box alone. And of course, inside we get the Blu-ray 3D and the regular old Blu-ray as well as a digital um, download, I believe. But yeah, the bonus features include, of course, an alt alternate opening. Oh, an alternate opening, eh? Then we also get deleted scenes, Dragon Sheep Chronicles, Welcome to New Burke, a, bur uh, a deck of dragons, Astrid's Hall, Dragon Trilogy in 60 seconds. <laughs> oh, this is... Oh, this is going to be epic. So I'm actually going to open this up, see what's inside, and then I'm going to watch it, because what else would I do with this now, right? Thank heavens these things come undone like quite easily actually. But yeah, I've got to be careful to keep this box in good shape because this is a this is a good box. I can emphasize that enough. But yeah, if I'm going to get uh, an edition of this, I'm going to get the limited edition. So that's what's so hype about it. So let's carefully open it up from the back here. Carefully, I say. 
Because here comes the coolest part about it, the Blu-ray cover. We're going to get to that in a second right here. But man, I love that Blu-ray cover. Oh, it's, it's very, very good looking. <laughs> I just cannot wait to watch this, okay? And then apart from that, oh boy, they've put it in weird. It's one of those where they've put that in the middle of it. And I don't want to like rip that out because I could ruin it. But it looks like I might have to. Oh, that's a big nuisance. That is a real big nuisance. So you know what? For now, I think I might just leave the Funkos in there. I'm going to close that back up and I'll worry about those later on rather than risking ruining the box. Because like I said before, that's one thing I don't want to do. So yeah, I'm just going to leave that to a side for a moment being and then get back to the whole comparison of these covers because why the heck not, right? Now, interestingly enough, all of these films are PG. None of them are universal, but yeah, all of these look so great with one another. It's like they are all from the same franchise because guess what? They are. Now, I'll probably do like the second box art for most because it has all the dragons in it rather than just for main characters. But at the end of the day, the main characters of this franchise are very well chosen because they are my favorite ones. Toothless and Hiccup are my favorite protagonists in the whole of animation history, so... There you go, you see, so I would say I'm going to watch this entire trilogy, don't have time to get through the first two, so I'm just going to watch the third one instead, but I will get through the entire trilogy at some point, and when I do, I will see you guys back here to talk about it. So I got and got a new TV for Christmas, which is very convenient because it's at a different angle to the other one, which is uh, very comfortable on my behalf. But regardless, on my PS4 right here, I have a background of Detroit Become a Human because why the heck not, and I'm playing uh, my Blu-rays for a PS4 because I don't have a Blu-ray player, so the PS4 is the next best thing, mind you. But the point of this whole clip right here is not to point out PS4 backgrounds of an awesome new TV I got for Christmas, which is making these movies look even better, by the way, but it's to do with the fact that the thumbnail for the third movie right here is the same scene as what's used in my intro. That is such a coincidence, because that intro was made before the Blu-ray was released. So I just love the fact that the thumbnail lines up with the intro right there. It's so cool, and I'm very satisfied by that. But without further ado, I'm so excited to rewatch this movie, so let's get into it, shall we? Man, now that is a trilogy. Oh, I love this trilogy so much. In fact, I love this franchise so much. Now, when I was re-watching this trilogy, I did throw in Gift of the, the Night Fury in there because that short film has such high emotions and not to mention the third film references back to it, making it an integral part to the overall uh, three film arching narrative of the movies. And I'm really glad the third film actually went back to reference that short. It makes the film feel even more interconnected and detailed and just the world that's actually lived in to really invest you. Because absolutely everything in this world is detailed down to the last sliver of information. And that's thanks in part to the TV shows, to the shorts, which could just be throwaway cash cows for franchise, but instead they're used to expand the lore give these characters interesting arcs to work with and above all make it feel like you could live in a world like this in such an expansive detailed world a world that's clearly worth owning on blu-ray because i own all three of these movies on blu-ray but clearly that's not enough which is why i went out and bought this so i could have all three films on dvd as well showcase my love for the entire trilogy and also make for a really nice display piece. But regardless, I'm going to talk about the trilogy um, first and foremost, which is a really, really nice binge, might I add, purely because each film develops upon the previous one. Because here's the thing, a lot of people don't like Hidden World as much as the other two. Watch it directly after those two and you will start to see how well it develops upon the core themes and values created in these first two movies. And tell me, after you've thought that through, it doesn't invest you or make you cry in any form or another. Because these sequels do exactly what sequels should. They expand the world, they give our characters new character arcs, they heighten the emotions, the scope. And they just make him feel so more grand, which is why I think both these sequels are better than the first one. Because the first one does have its own set of flaws, 
first of all, it's very montage heavy, which kind of feel a bit lazy at points. And it can also feel a bit generic at points, with it um, basically just being a boy and his pet type story. So, and I have no problem with that template whatsoever. It just doesn't feel as unique or original as the second movies do. And because this is so worried about establishing everything, the pacing doesn't work quite as well for a start. And really, because these are just setting up the core elements that make this franchise, it's really when you expand upon those elements that this franchise really starts to soar high. <laughs> soar, because there's dragons. Eh? Eh? <laughs> but enough of my terrible puns. The first movie is still great without a doubt. The animation holds up spectacularly. This is when the secondary characters are at their best without a doubt. It's not loud. <laughs> Roughnut and Toughnut are not annoying in this one, which is probably the biggest highlight for this film. The only things that are bad about the sequels really are those characters. Like, literally, these films are so perfect that the only flaws I can find within them is how annoying the secondary characters can be. And who cares about secondary characters when our primary protagonists, Hiccup and Toothless, are so layered and investing. You want them to succeed in their story because they're such likeable, charming characters. And when their arcs come to the climax in How to Train Dragon Her Home World, when Toothless finds his love, which is so well executed, and Hiccup learns that the best way for dragons to thrive is for them to go to their own world, away from humans, and to give them what the dragons need rather than what he wants. It's such a spectacular arc for both of them as they both become such inspirations to their respective kinds and it's <laughs> such a good wrap-up uh, this is both sad crying and happy crying at the same time because the ending is so bittersweet in that regard and i love the fact that each of these films were building up to that so if i were to rank the entire trilogy i would go with the second one being the best Hidden World being right in the middle, and the first one being last. But with that being said, done, as I said, this film is still, without a doubt, a 9 out of 10. Literally, the only problems I have with it is how it gets a little montage heavy. It can be a little generic at points. But the characters are at their best when it comes to the secondary ones, at least. And it still has to be an animation, and it introduces us to one of the best animated soundtracks of all time. No, take it back. The best animated soundtrack of all time. The music in here was so good that most of it is just remixed and reused for the second two movies, with only a few original tracks um, thrown in there. But if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's all I can say about that. So the other two are absolutely 10 out of 10s. 9 out of 10 for the top one. What a trilogy. But I've already started to uh, to allude upon why I love this franchise as a whole, and I've said already, but it's because of how detailed it is with all of the other forms of media that this franchise takes, such as the canon um, TV shows and shorts, which are very fun to watch, might I add. And just, once again, detailed this world to the point where it feels like it's lived in because every single hair in this universe is explained in detail. And stuff that isn't explained in the movies, they explain in extras and shorts. How did Hiccup get that awesome, fiery, uh, sword-based thing? <laughs> Watch a TV show, which might seem cheap, but to me, that feels expansive and worldly. But that's not the only reason I love this trilogy. It's, of course, for characters, for strong characters, which I was talking about in the trilogy itself. The animation is DreamWorks' best, and the direction sparks style and passion. The people who work on these films are really passionate in their craft. You can see it. And it's so inspiring to see a media franchise which the producers, the directors, the cast, the crew all have such passion in. It's so great to see stories like this being told. And it's, as I said before, inspiring in so many ways. There's also dragons in this franchise. In case you can't tell, I love dragons. They are so cool in concept. Artwork for them can be phenomenal. Uh, phenomenal from fantasy artists who can draw. 
I can't draw, but I've seen dragon artwork and it's incredible. And animation in and of itself is art. And because the animation is so good in this franchise, therefore the art is also fantastic. So artists can look up to this film, filmmakers can look up to this film, all for the passion and the craft put into every single frame. Storytellers can also look up to this franchise and how in-depthful it is, how well it builds up its characters. And I can look up to this franchise just because it has dragons in it and several other things that I love, such as good filmmaking. And when it comes to the dragons, I've only touched the surface of what this franchise has to offer because there are so many different species. It is so original. Every single species has its own unique feeling to it. Each one is very in-depth in terms of its design, how the dragons work with their biology, how they hunt, are, are, are they pack dragons? All of these questions go through the minds of the artists. Every single time they come up with a new dragon design, and because of it, it makes every dragon feel unique and in-depth. There's no, no other media franchise I know of that puts this much effort into species of creatures that don't even talk. The dragons in this franchise don't even talk, and yet they are so expressive. What these, what this trilogy manages to do that most other films can't do is it manages to tell you so much by using so little words. It's show and not tell, which other animated films should look up to, because if you're tired of films that don't shut up, these are your films, with such huge expression shown through body language of these different dragon species that react and hunt in different ways that feel in depthful and expressive. And it's so great. I love how many dragons there are. I love how unique they all are. I love how fleshed out the world is. What don't I love about this franchise, let's be honest? Nothing. It's so good. So I want to tell you guys a story before we get to the final element of this here video. So let's get into it without further ado. So I once had a small little beanie bag type thing that was filled with beans, but what was filled with beans you might ask? Well, the face of Toothless of course, which was flat out adorable, so that's one thing to love about it, but better yet is the way how I got it originally. Now unfortunately it seems as though I've lost it, so it's no longer within my possession. But still, the story lives on, you could say. So I was at an arcade all the way in Wales, which is far from where I live, to say the least. And, um, there was a little arcade cabinet, £2, but it was basically a win every time. So it was a crane game where you kept on playing it until you won something. So inside of it was, um, these beanie bags, but the beans were filled inside of the head of several different DreamWorks characters you could say, so there was one for Poe, one for Alex from Madagascar, uh, so on and so forth, all of these beanie bag type things, all of the faces looking adorable mind you, but I wanted Toothless, okay, no one else would do but Toothless, so I was at the arcade cabinet for what must have been an hour, an hour and a half, trying to get this Toothless little bean bag type thing, and um, to be honest, £2 to last me about an hour and a half is actually really good inside an arcade because the grabber was so crappy but I told my parents we are not going until I win this toothless beanbag okay we were not leaving the arcade until I got my £2 worth and then I finally won it after failed Upon failed, upon failed attempts, my grabber finally decides to do what I'm asking of it and grab that toothless beanie and drop it in the prize hole. I was so proud of myself for winning that and so happy that I owned it. It was so cute, so cool, and it represented at the time what I found to be the cutest DreamWorks character. Now is my favourite DreamWorks character, not just because he's cute, but because Toothless is just such a badass. It's another reason why I love this franchise. I mentioned before about how Toothless is a really strong character despite the fact that he has no dialogue whatsoever. 
because his actions say more, more than words, but he's also just such a badass. And the second movie, when he takes on the Alpha just to protect Toothless, it gives me goosebumps every time just to watch Toothless being such a badass, and I love him for it. But yeah, cute, interesting story about how it took me an hour and a half in an arcade for me to get a toothless beanie but I was so determined and it so worked out for me in the end and it worked out for my parents too because they gave me two pound expecting me to be back five minutes later asking for more money but turns out I was in that arcade for an hour and a half of just two pounds so basically it pleased everyone but now let's get back to the video but at that I want to thank you guys so much for watching and I hope you guys love this franchise as much as I do because it's just so investing to me, this world, it's characters. I love seeing all the different dragon species, especially considering that they all have their own unique ways of going about things, their own sets of flaws and strengths and how they, even how they react with other dragons, you know, sometimes. The dragon species can be so in-depth and so well written that one dragon can be for specific flaw to another dragon due to abilities like how the Skulldron is a predator to the Sea Shocker because they're both water based and it just so happens that the Skulldron is faster and more deadly than the Sea Shocker. Stuff like that on how the dragon species interact with one another is very infesting and <laughs> So well written, I cannot emphasize this enough. The writing is so in depth, and because of that, it makes every single element of this franchise feel lived and breathed in, and because of that, it allows you to invest yourselves more. And I'm so glad of that. I'm so glad that I can feel like I belong in a world as spectacular as this. And I'm glad that I feel these emotions every single time I watch these movies. Every single time I watch them, I tear up. Because it doesn't matter how many times I've watched them, the emotions will always keep running because they are so strong and so well executed. I do have a few nitpicks for the film that do make it less than perfect you could say, the small imperfections which if were to be changed and manipulated in some way could create an even better film than what the hidden world already is. So naturally over the course of the remainder of this video we're going to be talking about how I would adjust certain parts of this film to therefore just in other words minimize my nitpicks and make this a better film because of it. And that naturally comes from cutting out certain scenes and just rearranging certain uh, character positions. So rather than Tuff not getting so much screen time um, dedicated to his relationship with Hiccup throughout this film and just Ruffnut banging on about uh, the wedding and everything, I would instead, uh, particularly when Hiccup goes looking out for the Light Fury, um, have fish legs in that scene instead, just so that then the fish legs uh, can maybe talk to Hiccup about um, the relationship that Toothless is developing with this new girl dragon and talk about how, oh I couldn't cope if Meatlog got a boyfriend or something like that, and that could tie back to the Snuggle Tog short, the original one, Gift of a Night Fury, which this film just acknowledged, so seeing that integrated more would have been really really cool to see, and it maybe would have given Fishlegs more of an arc because he's an absolute nerd so I would have loved to see him nerd out more and he could have definitely done that with Hiccup maybe to set up the whole scenario could have been like I want to see this dragon for real so that's why he goes with Hiccup maybe he's even the one who notices for trap and gets all scared about Grimmel's um Trapping techniques you could say and ultimately over the course of the film he learns, learns to be less intimidated by Grimmel Maybe he gets a solo scene of Grimmel at some point where Grimmel is just talking about how devious dragons are and in the end He gets angry and confronts the foul villain that would be really really cool to see Maybe even when Hiccup was uh, talking with Grimmel when they got captured by the giant cage Maybe fish legs could uh, tune in and you know maybe just stand up to Grimmel in some sort of way But above all I feel like what this main arc could be here that could be set up in that their conversation is about him learning to let go of meat lug just how hiccup has to with toothless you know that could have made of a scene where all the dragons have to leave even more impacting as it fulfilled um the end of 
Fisher Legs character arc, and we truly get to invest in that relationship much more, only for it to be shattered. So again, I feel like they could have done so much more with a conversation between Hiccup and Fishlegs in that situation. I would have also removed all of the dumb dialogue pieces on Scott Lout's behalf. I would have got rid of his poop jokes. I would have got rid of the line where he talked about who died and made you chief, so on and so forth. I absolutely would have cut all of that stuff. However, the stuff with Valka and Eric kind of playing to his weaknesses and making a game out of his own arrogance, that stuff I would have kept in because that stuff was funny and highly characterized and then we get to Ruffnut her scene with Grim on how dumb it is this I would have cut out entirely or I would have had it another way to where when she landed on New Burke uh, or not even when she landed on New Burke even when she landed on an island outside of New Burke where Hiccup is maybe taking a rest with Toothless and um, they realize Ruffnut is there and ask how she escaped and she's like I escaped because I knew I would be so annoying and I decided to lead him away from the island. And then it turns out that Grimmel actually went in the opposite direction of Ruffner, knowing that he would lead her away from the island. So it's kind of like Ruffner trying to outsmart Grimmel in a way, given her character arc, because of course in the beginning of the movie she's very, very stupid. So seeing her evolve and become less stupid would have been very compelling. Of course, we don't get any of that, and she's still incredibly stupid throughout, which is a huge shame and so annoying. But once again, it would have really invested us in Grimmel's character some more since he actually made the right decision and went to Newburgh. So, yeah, that whole idea of outsmarting someone who thinks is outsmarting you would have just gone to make Grimmel an even better villain than the simple body language that we did get through the scene with him and Ruffner, and above all, it would have just took... It would have made the whole scene less annoying knowing that there was a character arc behind it. But what I would have done that's even better is cut the scene out entirely. Make it so that Ruffin it wasn't even captured so we don't even need to look at this or watch this scene even. Because here's the thing. We don't need a way on how Grimmel finds the dragons because we already know that he's tracking them. So as an audience we can put two and two together. Grimmel's tracking them. Oh yeah, obviously in the end he just wound up finding them. And he knew that Hiccup and Toothless were going to be separated in some way, so it would have been very, very easy for him to have gotten to Toothless, mind you. Once again, that would have showed off his great intelligence, being able to track for dragons even in a, in a more intelligent way than just hearing some idiot name drop for New Place. So yeah, again, it literally just comes to rearranging certain character moments and... Uh, Adding in more content, definitely. I've told you already that I wanted to increase the runtime of this film. And that could have been done via cutting of those sequences, those dialogue pieces that were unnecessary. Cutting them short, like where Toughnut comes in to give Hiccup more marriage advice where after he's speaking with Gobber about his worry for Toothless. He could have just cut the scene when Gobber says evidence will suggest I'm tasty. That would have been the perfect place to cut, get rid of the Tough nut shit. But enough of my whispering it to the camera of the naughty words. Um, the scenes I would have added came from really all of the alternate and deleted scenes and the extended ones even. I would have loved to see the extended scene. And I'm going to talk about these in more detail in a later video. But the point is there was an extended sequence of Hiccup making this new tale for Toothless with a lot of passion put into it. So I would have loved to see that. And there's also another scene, another stoic flashback scene. That was cut for being a bit too on the nose, apparently, and I couldn't care less. It was a sweet scene, so I would have loved to see that. And it was talking about how Hiccup now has this responsibility bestowed upon him. And sure, it would have felt on the nose, but since it's such a cute scene, I would have loved that in there anyway. And it really could have added to Hiccup's character arc and how he feels responsible for all these mistakes he's making and that he needs to take responsibility for the situation and rise up, you know, it's a more fulfilling arc, you could say. And then I would have also loved the alternate opening with the Crimson Gorgutter being introduced in a slightly different way to where, of course, you know, Hiccup and Toothless are out there trying to train it, showing the great chemistry between those two characters. And then they could have had the ship sequence later on in the film, like maybe when uh, Eric says that there's new trapper barges you know, and Gobber says, one day you'll choose a fight that you won't win. We cut to the um, ship sequence that opens up the film instead. 
Or alternatively, we still have that opening because it's a very strong opening with a one take and everything. Um, and keep that opening and instead introduce the Crimson Gorgutter at a slightly later time. Or who knows, maybe that could be even incorporated as a flashback. So the Crimson Gorgutter maybe destroys the new... Or, or Hiccup comes back to when Newberg is being destroyed by the Crimson Gorgor to be in a gentle giant with fish meat and then uh, Hiccup f uh, flashes back after Gobber is complaining about uh, the Crimson Gorgor to destroying the island saying do you remember how I got this guy with Toothless and how cute he was and how great he is for our arsenal so on and so forth something that just leads into a nice flashback would have been very very nice to see that mind you just because once again it really showed off the bond between Toothless and Hiccup so great and would love to see more of that. Now you guys can tell this is not scripted, but that really summarizes my main thoughts as to how to change the mild imperfections in this film to make it even better than what it already is. But as it stands, The Hidden World is still a 10 out of 10. And these are literal just nitpick fixes, you could call them. So the topic of conversation today is going to be my favorite scene from every How to Train Your Dragon movie, as well as a few honourable mentions here and there. So starting off with the first movie, my first honourable mention is going to go to when Hiccup lost his leg towards the end of the movie. That is a very emotionally hitting scene, especially when you see Hiccup's expression at his loss. It's very heartbreaking, and it sits in stone that this is an animated franchise that takes risks and, have, and has consequences to its actions even, so going further into the franchise that adds further tension and drama to certain sequences and the TV shows and for films and everything. So I'm glad this scene exists purely to set in um, place for tone and for overall dark paths that this franchise isn't afraid uh, to go into, you know, the risks it takes, and I adore this scene for that. Then there is, of course, when Hiccup and Toothless first meet up. That is a very powerful moment as well, as Hiccup sees himself in Toothless, which, you know, that's later revealed in the film and give him more detail to when he's having his conversation with Astrid after, you know, Toothless is captured and all of the Vikings are practically heading off to their doom at the nest of the Green Death. Um, so yes, those two are very powerful scenes as well, but there's also the training sequence which can get very repetitive and a bit slow paced, but it's still very, very powerful with a lot of um, music to help heighten your emotions and of course some very touching visuals like when of course Hiccup reaches his hand out to Toothless, very very powerful stuff. But easily, easily my favourite scene of How to Train a Dragon 1, and it's so easy that's why I said it twice to emphasise it, it has to be First Flight. This scene is spectacular, it has multiple functions, okay? It helps grow Hiccup's character as he grows in confidence. It's visually stunning. The physics on the water and the camera angles chosen just show off the beauty of Burke and the expression of Hiccup and Toothless together as they ride. So it's powerful on an emotional scale because of course we have Hiccup growing as a character, it's visually stunning, and it creates goosebumps because it's also exciting, and what heightens that excitement is for music. The score for this whole segment is so adrenaline pumping, and that's really what gets the goosebumps um, going, and it makes the scene exciting, beautiful, impactful. Everything you want in what's defined as a great animated scene can be found in the first flight and it's easily the best moment of the first film. Seeing these two characters come together and fly with one another with perfect chemistry on top of that is truly cherry on top of the cake and I love this scene. But now we get to move on to the second movie which the true question about this film is which scene isn't the best, okay? I may as well just class every single scene in this film as the best one because absolutely every scene in this film has something to it that is spectacular. We have, of course, the family reunion, starting off with when Stoic meets up with Valka and it emphasizes the change that Stoic has gone through as he gives the complete opposite reaction to what Valka was expecting. That's, again, some very 
impactful writing that really shows how well they know these characters and adds layers to their characters on top of it. And then to follow that up directly, we have this song which is highly adrenaline pumping right after moments of sad notes and so as the song speeds up in pace and becomes far more exciting, so does the background music and overall due to this roller coaster of emotions from you going from sadness and desperation to utter joy and happiness, it's very very memorable because of these juxtaposed feelings coming together to create one full sequence of events and what happens later in the movie makes it even more heartbreaking knowing that this is Stoic's last moment with his family before the huge battle occurs and of course his death is carried out so that makes that scene even more impactful especially on the second time through but then this leads us to Stoke's death itself which isn't the saddest part of the second movie it's very sad when all the dragons are of course flying away and Drago captures Toothless and flies off with him especially after Hiccup pushed him away it's very very heartbreaking but even worse than that is Stoke's funeral my runner-upper for my favorite sequence because it's very emotionally impacting, okay, I cry at it every single time, and then Valka comes through with her speech to help Hiccup's character grow, and that is so powerful as well, it's such fantastic writing, it's easily one of the best motivational speeches I've ever heard in an animated film, it really takes a turn around in terms of the climax, and ultimately is what leads to the climax and my favourite sequence, which is Toothless versus the Be Water Beast, which comes up directly after Hiccup turns Toothless back again, which is amazing in and of itself because we get to see these two characters connect and have that amazing chemistry again that I was talking about with First Flight. And that's just so much of a joy to watch, and I adore that. But I adore Toothless versus the Be Water Beast even more because despite the Be Water Beasts, size and threat, which I truly cannot be size enough considering that I cannot speak right now. Despite all of that, Toothless challenges it anyway because he loves Hiccup so much and wants desperately to protect him. It shows how strong this bond is and why it's the glue that keeps this franchise together. And the action is phenomenal. It's so well shot. And the sound effects on top of that really draw you into the world as they feel realistic. And it truly makes you feel like you're there. So I love the investment factor in it. I love how badass Toothless is and how in character he is. And I just love the concept of Toothless going above and beyond for Hiccup. It's such a sweet sentiment. Of course, there is one thing ruining this scene when, of course, Hiccup and Valkor explains for the audience that, hey, he's challenging for Bewilder Beast to save Hiccup. Yeah, we can see that, you really need to explain it, but with that one miniature nitpick out of the way, it's such a fast paced and awesome scene. And of course we go from these really emotional lows of Stoic's funeral and Hiccup losing Toothless to then the emotional high of Toothless being an absolute badass and defeating the Bewilder Beast. Again, it's the emotional roller coasters that really get the heart in adrenaline mode and make for a very memorable experience, that's what it is. I would define this scene as an experience. But now we move on to the third and final movie of this trilogy, at least so far. Hopefully they don't make a fourth one, because I think that would ruin it, even if it is a spin-off. But as I digress, How to Train Your Dragon 3 is yet again another film with some amazing scenes in it. Granted, it also has the worst scene in the entire trilogy, when of course Roughnut is annoying, not only Grimmel, but the entire audience as well, but let's just cut that seat out, pretend it never existed, because we have the discovery of a hidden world to talk about. On a visual level, the hidden world is distinct, unique, very well designed, and it just looks gorgeous. It's amazing what the animators and designers were able to do with a hidden world of dragons, and the detail they put into it is unparalleled. Then there's, of course, the romantic flight between he uh, Toothless and the Light Fury. Stripping out all of the dialogue and leaving it in music and dragon sound effects alone and the body language between these two and the chemistry that creates is enough to tell a powerful, investing love story that's once again visually jaw-dropping. This sequence in 3D is some of the best 3D I have seen in a long, 
a long time. Just visually, my jaw was dropped during the sequence, and as was my emotions. And by dropped, I mean heightened significantly because I was so invested in these two's relationship, and I so wanted them to get together. But of course, I, I really wish that my favourite scene could be the whole climax because we start off with the flashback to Stoic and how he's crying over the loss of Valka and teaching Hiccup the lesson of love about how with love comes loss and that's a very powerful, mature message to send to kids which of course I love that, I love how mature and risky this message is and of course it's emotional as well, I cried this uh, sequence the first time I saw it because it gave off so much character to Stoic and added in so much context to previous movies making them all the more powerful for it and then we lead from that straight into Hiccup being motivated by Astrid and then him uh, proceeding to storm the Armada, rescue Toothless, and then he's saved by the Light Fury, who the whole movie has been avoiding him and trying to get rid of him. And then at the very end of the climax, she saves him. They gave the best character arc of the movie to a freaking dragon, and it blows my mind how amazing that sequence is. Once again, uh, for soundtrack and company in that. And the fact that you really think Hiccup's about to die and then he's saved at the last minute. It's just so exciting and gets the goosebumps rolling and the emotion is heightened on either side. As the whole climax gets you from going from sadness and desperation to once again joy and utter happiness. But the greatest part of this climax is when the dragons have to leave. Mostly because we all knew it was coming, but I don't think anyone knew. It was going to hit as hard as it did. Because us as the audience, knowing how the film's going to end, kind of created a sense of dread throughout the whole film. I was scared for when the dragons were going to leave because I knew it was going to hit so hard. But without knowing how hard it was going to hit, when it suddenly came and you knew it was coming from the moment that Toothless looked at Hiccup and then looked off to the horizon, you saw it coming. And the emotion just, all of a sudden, it hits you. It comes out of nowhere, and it hits like a wrecking ball. And that's what makes it so well executed. It's, it's truly fantastic how they were able to successfully build this and pay it off. It's such a damn bittersweet ending, and I, I love it. There was no way they could have done it better, and it's why it's the best my most favourite sequence of the end of this trilogy, you know, best moment of the hidden world. But ultimately, my favourite of these three sequences has to be Toothless vs. Be Water Beast. That was like the highlight of this franchise for me, but the Dragon's Thieving is a very close number two. And the hidden world easily has the greatest climax, so it definitely has that going for it. Let me start off by saying that the best How to Train Your Dragon sequel would be no sequel at all because this masterpiece right here concluded the trilogy in such a satisfying way which honestly could not have been done better so it's best not to undermine the importance and the impact this film has uh, with a needless sequel or spin-off. However, if a such a thing was to occur, what would uh, my personal hopes and dreams be for How to Train Your Dragon sequel or spin-off? Well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about, but again, this is the perfect conclusion, and the best sequel or spin-off would be no sequel or spin-off at all. So if we were to get additional Dragons content, what I would love to see most of all would be a small spin-off movie released directly to Netflix because then, you know, we wouldn't need to worry about it necessarily ruining or, well, as I put it, undermining the impact that the third film had on the series, at least theatrically. So what could be perfect is taking all the side characters from Race to the Edge and making an entire film about them, like taking Dagger and the rest of the Berserkers, uh, Heather as well, and making an entire spin-off film around them, set during the same time as The Hidden World, and we can get a really emotional climax where, of course, Heather and Dagger realise that they too need to um, let go of their dragons. We get to uh, have our goodbyes to, of course, um, Windshear and all of the other dragons like that. So again, it could um, 
be ruined by similarity from the hidden world but because this would kind of be a mix up in perspectives and we get to see what the events of that film was like for side characters that we've got to know and love from Race to the Edge would generally make this the perfect film for the Netflix platform because of course that's where these characters are known from, that's the platform which they originated so keeping them exclusively to that, that platform will just feel like it would fit and could create just for a really satisfying conclusion because you know the hidden world might have offered us a finalized arc for Hiccup and all of the other teenagers as well as their dragons but we never really got any sort of clear cut conclusion to Dagger, Heather um, and of course for Wing Maidens or the side characters like that so a spin-off film a direct to Netflix spin off film, even for that, would be pretty great and obviously the best we could get out of any additional Dragons media. It certainly would be better than the uh, Rescue Riders that we've got as of late, which is for kids and kids only. Regardless, um, if we were to get a mainstream How to Train Your Dragon sequel, what would I like to see? Well, of course, I would like to see our mainstream characters come back. You know, you can't exactly have a mainstream sequel without for mainstream characters um so i want this to be set uh, during the um era where of course vikings and dragons are at peace you know between either the first or second movie or the second or third movie set in a, f a film here could create some really bad implications upon the timeline it could create inconsistencies and just generally make the whole um series canon feel like a mess which i don't want and i also don't want a prequel film to the first because the heart of How to Train Your Dragon is within the bond between Vikings and Dragons, so having to see the Vikings kill dragons again would just... It would take away from a franchise, honestly. It would feel unfitting, and it would just lose the flair that makes this franchise so special, so I wouldn't want to see a prequel either. So all that's really left is a sequel to The Hidden World. Um, this could be set in between the wedding and, of course, the little epilogue. Um, towards the end of the hidden world but I don't think that's going to be a good time frame to set it either again for inconsistency's sake and because I would want a sequel to be oriented around Hiccup's kids most notably Sefer because uh, for those of you who remember my homecoming review you guys will remember that Sefer was my favorite part of that short by miles just because she was so characterized she was unique while still being a blend of Astrid and Hiccup and you know she truly felt like the daughter of those two characters combined um so that just gave me an instant investment into her character and you know they could go so much more in depth with her character make her layered and just really fun to watch not to mention she's a child so that childish naivety could be really relatable and they could give her just an exceptional arc without a shadow of a doubt and maybe it could revolve around Sefer maybe um getting lost, you know, maybe getting kidnapped, as ridiculous as that would be, but point is, she's taken away from the island of Newburgh, and so our, our Hiccup has to balance the search for his daughter with, of course, his important chiefly duties, and the impact and the emotional toll that that puts on him and Astrid could be something really investing um, to watch, mind you. And then as for how it could tie back to dragons, because of course dragon is in the name of the title, I kind of want dragons and everything, maybe whilst Zeva is lost or kidnapped or in danger, you know, maybe a dragon comes to her aid and they grow a bond, but then come the end of it, she learns as to why dragons were sent away, maybe if a dragon is injured at, at, during the final battle or something like that. And so she has to send it away and their bond comes to an end. Once again, this would be very similar to The Hidden World, so it would feel kind of cheap on the emotional front because of that. But DreamWorks and their exceptional writers could definitely make it work. So really, that's what I would want to see out of the sequel. Just a greater exploration of Sephir's arc. You know, her having to leave Newburgh, her becoming her own entity, because she's definitely a strong character. She could definitely hold her own. And if she was put on the back of a dragon, even more so... And getting to see a bond between someone who's not lived with dragons their whole life and see how that could, of course, compare to Hiccup, who had dragons his entire life up until um, the end of the Hidden World. It could definitely create some very clever, layered writing, and it could add more lore to the Dragons universe, because we could get to see what Viking times were like after the dragons left, you know, how the Viking hunters suffered because of their lack of business, um, 
you know, maybe people were chasing legends because maybe uh, e e even only 10 years after the dragons have left, it could still have been conceived as a myth uh, to begin with, especially for, you know, young children who, as I was alluding to with Sefa, had never seen a dragon. In fact, Sefa wouldn't have ever seen a dragon if it weren't for the fact that she saw Toothless and her uh, Toothless for Light Fury, of course, Stormfly and all of the night lights all combined in that awesome epilogue sequence in the hidden world. But regardless, I can't emphasize enough that the best sequel to this series would be no sequel at all, but if there was to be a sequel, and as Dragon fans we had to bite the bullet and accept a sequel, then that would be my hopes for what a sequel could provide us with. Um, and that's of course very basic ideas, purely because I don't want to go too in-depth in this, I don't want to give DreamWorks any ideas, so to say. <laughs> Plus, a shorter video just to get my ideas out there is just more digestible, more bite-sized, and that's the aim of this video, you know, to create a bite-sized fun little discussion video, and you guys can let me know your opinion on these stupid ideas in the um, comment section below, or you can let me know whether you like them. I'm okay with it either way, because you've interacted with the video, and that would be awesome of you. We've looked previously at my favourite scenes within every House of Dragon Dragon movie. Well, we're going to return once again to every single Dragon movie, but rather than looking at my favourite scenes, we're going to be looking at my favourite dragons introduced. Now, we're not talking about the particular species in every single case, we're talking more so about the character of the dragon and the personality that they bring to the film, in other words. Um, so my favourite new dragon introduced in every single movie is what we're going to be talking about today. I would also um, include for TV shows and for shorts and everything, but ultimately it's the films where this topic becomes more interesting, so I'm just going to quickly gloss over the TV shows and these honourable mentions right here, because my favourite from Riders slash Defenders of Burk, I would say personally, would probably be the Snap Trapper because I love the design of that dragon, but unfortunately, we never actually saw that in the TV shows. The, uh, the closest thing we got to seeing that in 3D was its short little animated segment drawn from the Book of Dragons, so I'd say my favourite from that short would be Snapper Trapper from the Book of Dragons. Then Legend of the Bow Napper is of course a Bow Napper because that's the only new dragon in the whole thing. Then Gift of the Night Fury doesn't even have any new dragons to be introduced. Same with Dawn of New um, Dragon Races, or Dawn of the Dragon Races even. I'm getting um, the name between Dawn of New Races and Dawn of New Riders completely mixed up. Uh, as I move on, there's also Homecoming, which also doesn't have any new dragons, so I can't exactly talk about that one. So there are more reasons why I weren't uh, aiming to talk about the shorts from the TV shows to a huge extent. But going back to Riders slash Defenders of Burke, my favourite dragon introduced there is probably the Changeling. I love how it phases into the background, how it spits acid at... Um, you know, our riders and everything, it's pretty damn cool actually, um, I do wish that they had more colour iterations rather than their base colour just being red all the time, you know, it could have been a bit like a deadly nadder where you have blues, greens, purples, but uh, unfortunately that just wasn't meant to be with a change wing apparently. Regardless, my favourite from Race to the Edge, now this T uh, this TV show introduced so many awesome new dragons, you had the Death Song, you had the Cabin Crasher, but my favourite has to be the Catastrophic Quaken, I love the size and power of this dragon and they perfectly capture the scope of what this dragon is capable of, because when he rolls into a ball, jumps up and then slams down, you feel the shockwave as it hits you. And the amount of power that this presents these dragons with is amazing, and not to mention I love the design of a dragon with the uh, really unique jaw design. It really does make this dragon feel distinctive amongst the border class of dragons. And it's introduced as an antagonist in one of the episodes, so it uh, gives room for fish legs to develop in some very interesting ways. So, point here is that it's design really brings out the best in some of our characters here with the fact of how it challenges them and it just so happens to create some of the best episodes like Quake, Rattle and Roll is one of my favourite episodes of the show so of course I'm gonna adore the catastrophic Quaken even though some of you might say it pales comparison on a design standpoint because it's a little more generic being a boulder um, type dragon you know with the spikes and the ball-esque aesthetic uh, rather than maybe a death song which 
has much more uniqueness put into its design, which is probably my second favourite dragon from a TV show, but ultimately I just think that the catastrophic quake in uh, it features some better episodes, and as I said before, its personality brings out greater evolution, or development I should say, within our characters. But now let's finally talk about these movies. So the first film, uh, you guys know what it is already before you've even clicked on the video, you know, you've read that title and you've realised, this guy's favourite dragon from the first movie is Toothless, of course it's Toothless, who else could it be? It's the bond between him and Hiccup which sets up this entire franchise and DreamWorks make it such a powerful moment. If this bond wasn't as strong as it was, then this entire franchise simply wouldn't work. But because it is, that's what makes the entire franchise and how it expands upon this bond so powerful and presented with such raw emotion. <laughs> Because Toothless is so expressive through body language because he can't speak whatsoever and the way how he interacts with Hiccup between drawing him a little maze for him to traverse through after we learn in the A plot that um, he can't really manoeuvre around an arena all that well. It's not as if Toothless knew that but uh, he could tell he was weak and scrawny and really needed to increase his alertness and manoeuvrability in the arena so him drawing that uh, little maze for him, Tr truly taught him about being alert and how to manoeuvre the arena, so the fact that this bond makes it so that then the A plots and B plots of the film are constantly intertwining and uh, impacting one another is what makes the film itself so well crafted and very very uh, well written even if the uh, structure is a little repetitive. But it's just the bond between these two, with how expressive Toothless is, and his willingness to do anything for Hiccup. He literally hears him screaming in the arena, and we get to see the determination on his face as he climbs out of the cove and runs through a forest to go get him. All of which are accomplishments that he was unable to achieve on his own, but now he's got motivation, and he was able to do so. It's just so epic, and it gives me goosebumps every time. And then, of course, you've got the final battle against the um, Green Death, not the Red Death, the Green Death, <laughs> anyway, um, of course once again Toothless has, has this expression for determination, even for worry, which adds again a lot of personality and it truly captures this relationship the two characters have immensely because Toothless listens to Hiccup whilst Hiccup puts his trust in Toothless to manoeuvre around the fire of this Green Death, for two truly fly in sync and it's just... Such a powerful way to test him at the end of a movie because this is what the movie was leading up to and it truly shows what this bond has built up to be and it proves to the other Vikings what a powerful bond between a dragon and a Viking can accomplish. But now we move on to the second movie, which my favourite dragon has to be, Volker's Stormcutter known as Clout Jumper. Which, first of all, is an awesome name because Cloud Jumper really reminds me of the name Cliff Jumper from Transformers, and he's one of my favourite Autobots. So, right out of the bat, the name is freaking awesome. But what do I love about Cloud Jumper? Absolutely everything. He has a double wing design, as do all of the other Stormcutters, and that just looks so incredible. It gives the dragons such unique animations as both uh, double sides of the wings flap. And oh, that, that unique movement alone makes this dragon distinctive, but not to mention Cloud Jumper has so much personality. He's kind of like a senior dragon taking care of all the other dragons, and you know, um, Toothless is kind of like playing around with him, and he's the more calmer dragon as he just kind of like plays around with Toothless' back, but not as energetic like. He just kind of like stays in the background and makes a move when he feels like it, a bit like when Toothless pops up and gets the snow all over his horns and then he just slowly tilts his horns to drop the snow on Toothless's face. It's just such a nice playful um, banter that these two have, so to say, and it's so expressive. So I love the bond between the two dragons, it's very powerful and again, really fun to watch on a visual level. You don't need any dialogue to make this an entertaining bond. And then his bond with Valka is also really great, the way how he looks at her, especially in the hidden world, and uh, if they can communicate, they know what each other's saying, so... Again, the communication there is very, very awesome to see, and I love Cloud Jumper's introduction uh, to create a very distinctive dragon design, and to create for some very interesting bonds between him and Valka, and him and Toothless, as they have a nice, playful nature with one another and uh, become really great friends really, really fast. Like, seriously, Toothless and Cloudjumper were practically friends immediately, more or less. 
So, of course, without a shadow of a doubt, Claptrap was my favourite Doom Dragon introduced in the second movie. But now we move on to the Hidden World, which unfortunately, this dragon doesn't have a name to it. And that's going to be the Crimson Gorgoda. Now, you might argue for Light Fury, because she has arguably the best arc in the entire movie, as she's spending the whole movie trying to get rid of Toothless, and, you know, she thinks that she's in the right by doing that, because she's seen humans as none other than a threat that wants to capture and control them. And so naturally she's trying to protect Toothless from that threat, and she sees her doing that as a sign of saving him, and then when of course Toothless goes back to rescue Hiccup, she's confused as to why she would help a dirty, filthy human. But of course, throughout the course of the film, Toothless continues to um, save Hiccup and, you know, express his love for him, so naturally the Light Fury picks up on this, realises that H H Hiccup is a good guy, that not all humans are bad, and comes back to save him at the very end of the movie. That goodbye with the awesome soundtrack gives me goosebumps every time, so yes, that is an incredible arc. But she's not as personality driven as the Crimson Gorgota, I'm afraid, in fact, um, What's wrong with her design is that it's basically toothless but white and slightly more feminist, which I personally don't have a problem with because of its symbolic nature within the context of the film. Because she represents the fact that um, she brings hope to the Fury species of dragons because up until this point we thought Toothless was the only Fury. Turns out he's the only Night Fury, but not the only Fury because there's pl plenty of Light Furies out there for the two to mate and of course have babies together and reproduce. So the White gives us hope for the future of the Furies and not to mention it's something that naturally Toothless would be attracted to. So within the context of, if, of this film, the design makes sense, but that doesn't make it as strong of a design as a Crimson Gorgutter, which takes things from real life, which gives us automatically something to relate to with this dragon, such as the moose horns and everything. And it just makes a really huge design, which its shape and size is taken so advantage of. It might be huge. And so once again, just like we did with the Catastrophic Quake, and we feel that power being presented before us as... When it hits the ground, it creates shock waves and it shatters uh, wood and buildings and rock in its path. You feel that power as it's presented before you with the way how it's shot in wide cinematic um, shots, mind you. And coupled out with the sound effects, you know, for rocks tumbling, for wood crackling, you know, it's truly presented with power. But at the same time, despite being powerful, and dangerous, the Crimson Gorglitter is presented in this film as a gentle giant, a complete opposite personality trait to what the design would imply, and that just goes to show how much life is brimming with this dragon. For developers, or for developers, I'm thinking of games right here, but no, what I meant to say is the filmmakers clearly put a lot of thought and effort into what this character's personality was going to be, and what his design was going to be, and how to make those as distinctive as possible. So here, we have a giant dragon, which is also gentle, what I like to call a gentle giant because he has an amazing relationship with fish meat where he's playful with a dragon which is literally the size of a tic tac in comparison to him and yet fish meat is comfortable going around him, going underneath him because he knows that the Crimson Gorgutter would never try to harm him and that you know the Crimson Gorgutter is always their first thing to protect him from the evil Viking conquerors and everything so the bond for two have how powerful it is, and the fact that it presents the Crimson Gorgoth to such a gentle giant, uh, this, uh, despite even the giant design that he possesses and the huge power that can be captured with this dragon. So that just, again, it makes him brimming with life and energy. I cannot truly really emphasize that enough, and it's amazing the personality they was able to convey with him with body language alone. In fact, it was amazing what they was able to do with all three of these dragons but with that being said and done this here how to train a dragon video is coming to an end so i want to thank you guys so much for watching this here discussion video as you can tell it clearly wasn't scripted but that's just because i wanted to create a nice discussion with you guys as to what some of your favorite dragon species are even if you haven't watched the tv shows and shorts you can go on ahead and let me know what your favorite dragon introduced in each movie was down below because who knows maybe you're one of the people who likes the hobgoblers i don't but let's, uh, let, let's wrap the video up here.
So a few weeks back, I loaned to my friend Luke Smith um, the How to Train Your Dragon DVD trilogy box set, and believe me, that's going to become important uh, later in the video. But regardless, um, this was uh, done with the sole purpose of allowing Luke to watch all three movies and loan me his uh, a clip on his favourite of the bunch. So I'm going to allow that to play out for you guys right now. Overall, this series is outstanding and I have watched it numerous times now. Aaron, I don't want to give, give this back to you, but I know, I, I know I'm going to have to in the end. Uh, I'm probably and pick up my own but yeah overall this series is very very underrated and my, i would say in my, in my overall favorite is number two which is generally classed as the worst one this isn't down down to the boss fight or anything like that well final battle it's down to the raw emotion that, that this film uh, 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 conveys all of them convey really good emotion but this is the one where I cried the most. <laughs> and yes, these films do, do uh, make you cry. So uh, I hope this was adequate for you guys and for you as, as, well, as well, Aaron, since you re requested this. And that brings us to the topic of today's video, How to Train Your Dragon 2, and how I agree with Luke that it's the best of this entire trilogy. But I didn't always have that idealism behind the movie. I have a rather love-hate relationship with the film, and so I feel like the six year anniversary is the perfect time to bring this up as a little story time uh, with you guys. And uh, what's funny about the six year anniversary is that it was actually two weeks ago today, at least for the UK release of the film. And so naturally I have delayed this video by two weeks exactly to parallel the number of films that was in this franchise once this film was released. So in other words, a two week delay for How to Train Your Dragon number two. 100% intentional. But as I digress, when I first watched this film at cinemas this six odd years ago, um... I didn't like it very much, and that's mostly because I went into it with the idealism that the first film is perfect as its own standalone movie and that a sequel can't do much to improve or expand upon it. So, uh, And it didn't help that 2014 was a year notorious for sequels and remakes and reboots. Like my birthday of that year, I got the really crappy rebooted Robocop uh, just because there were so many other films like it that came out that year. So naturally I was just being cynical with all of the unoriginality of the films that were released in that year. And if you go into a film with a specific idealism, the chances are the film has to do a lot to remove that from your mind and create a different experience, one that you wasn't expecting. So because I went into this film ready to hate it, that's exactly what I thought about it at first. I had so much hatred for this film because that's what I expected going in and um, I didn't give the film a chance or an opportunity to change my mind upon that. And what made me even more cynical towards the movie was that it was getting such great reviews at the time and I couldn't understand why, I generally couldn't. I'm like, what are these critics talking about? The movie isn't all that good. Um, so yeah, going into the film just with the mindset of this is going to suck and I'm not going to like it because it's not going to be as good as the first film, which was my first ever film I watched in cinemas by the way, so I had a huge nostalgia for that movie. I felt like it was perfect at the time and so naturally you can't top perfection with a sequel, so why even bother at this point besides, you know, the satisfaction of money, which hilariously enough this is the highest gross enough a trilogy, so clearly the second movie did uh, very well for DreamWorks, despite the fact that it came out in 2014, which was a bad year for DreamWorks overall, because they released three films this year, Mr. Peabody and Sherman, Penguins of Madagascar, and uh, How to Train a Dragon 2, so that was a bad decision on their behalf, because even if one film does incredibly well at the box office, like How Train Dragon 2 did, they still need to rely on the other two films doing well, which they did not, so that's why you don't release three films in the same year, because even if one is a huge success, you need to rely on the other two being a huge success as well, to avoid losing money that year. But regardless of the backstory behind How Train Dragon 2 and its time of release, um, Yes, that was my first opinions on the film when I very first watched it with my grandma who was kind enough to take me and my sister to go see it. I remember that um, 
there were some people right next to us, some kids I knew from school who were watching it with us, and of course they were making um, noises, drawing the ads and everything, and then once the um, DreamWorks logo came up, my grandma had to go over and tell them to shut up, and she absolutely hammered into them so that was quite entertaining and put a smile on my face before the film had even begun but that still didn't stop me from the inevitable disappointment of a how trade dragon sequel not living up to the first regardless um after that i must have saw the film one extra time when i was at my uh uncle and aunt's house because they had the film on blu-ray and i'm like i'll give this film a second chance and upon second rewatch, it once again, didn't do much to sway my opinions, and I still didn't like the film very much. However, one day, um, back in what must have been about 2018, just before I started this YouTube channel, I was in CEX and saw that How to Train a Dragon 2 was on for like £2, so I'm like, it's really cheap, I might as well give this film a second look in, because at this time I was uh, becoming a huge film buff, I had just got my Cineworld Unlimited card and was watching films left, right and centre. So I started to, uh, to get uh, to gain more critical skills in movies and started to differentiate a good film from a bad film. So I thought, why not give How to Train a Dragon 2 a second shot and see if it can change my mind now that I'm more critical towards movies and know what to look for in either good or bad ones. So I take it home, I watch it, and come the end, I was shocked at just how wrong I had been all these years. Finally, I could appreciate the second movie for its sheer and utter quality. It has raw emotion, excellent character development, some phenomenal character um, relationships, uh, which are not only established here, but are expanded upon. We get to see a greater expansion of Toothless and Hiccup and how they're bonded with one another, and better yet is for reunions between Hiccup and Valka. They are just poured in tragedy uh, due to, you know, the added context of Stoic actually dying after their dance sequence in the film, you know, so knowing that tragedy behind the film just adds further tension and dread into these sequences to ultimately up the emotion, which is what makes it so raw and untamed. So yes, needless to say, I hated the film at first because I was a blind, stupid kid who had enough of sequels that year. Um, and thought that How to Train Dragon 2 didn't do much to differentiate itself and that Big Hero 6 earned that Oscar. And now I'm here thinking, how the hell did I even hate this film originally? Because it's so damn good, there's so much right for this trilogy, and it has the most emotion out of any of these uh, DreamWorks films. I want to say DreamWorks in uh, entirety, not even just for, uh, let alone even, the How to Train Dragon franchise. So yes, that is uh, effectively, in other words, my love-hate relationship for the second How to Train Dragon movie. I sure hope you guys found the story time interesting, and I hope it, um, you know, brings justice upon the six-year anniversary of How to Train Dragon 2, because it's unbelievable that that film is over six years old already. Its animation truly has uh, stood for test of time and looks better than certain animated films coming out now. Well, he fooled me. He gave me like the How to Train Your Dragon DVDs just in a clear, clear case because you wanted the, basically the wrapping of the Yeah, of course. Case. I wanted this for collector's sake. Uh, yeah. Also, you not only get to see Aaron again, but you now get to see Aaron with soaked through hair. <gasps> That's a miracle. And Which an also honor. smells nice. It does. <laughs> And thanks again for the DVDs and, go I, uh, and goodbye again, Aaron. And remember, you're double trouble. We are double trouble. No, you're double trouble. We. If, if you're double trouble and I'm double trouble, then together we are quadruple double trouble. trouble. So I'm going to start off with The Whisper in Death. Now, what's unfortunate about this dragon is that because it was limited to the TV shows, is we've never got to see it with really great texturing work because that's one of the weak points when it comes to the animations of either of these shows for texturing work. So with a higher budget, I think The Whisper in Death could have looked even greater and that would have done it more justice too because The Whisper in Death has a really unique uh, animation when it comes to their flying style since they have the swirling uh, spines and for small little wings 
So ultimately, getting to see that unique animation would have added a lot of detail to the wide cinematic shots featuring hundreds upon hundreds of dragons, such as when uh, all of the Burkians are fleeing um, Burke, of course, or when uh, we see the hidden world with all of the dragons paying their respect to Toothless, or, you know, in the first few movies where we see Hiccup, Toothless, and Astrid discovering the nest of the Green Death for the first time, or the second movie where we see Valka's nest for the first time and all of the dragons circling that giant ice uh, icicle so to say i was about to say ice spire but it's more of an icicle than an ice spire but as i digress just having that unique animation um style of a dragon mixed in with all of the other dragons would have just added that extra uniqueness and detail to those shots and could have made them even grander and even more cinematic now one thing i don't like about how to train dragon 2 is when of course our side characters land uh, outside of drago's lair for the first time and are just mysteriously ambushed by camouflaged humans that just felt out of character for astrid to not really notice anything going on in fact her whole character was out of character from that movie uh, but as i digress uh, i feel like an ambush from drago's change wings could have made that scene a lot more interesting so ultimately i think change wings uh, could have added a lot more tension to scenes especially if editors were to show us for change wings before they showed the characters created for a lot of dramatic irony and tension within the scene since you know they're very stealth type dragons which could have created for very unique uh, action set pieces so overall the traits of the change wing uh, and how they could have lent themselves to drago's lair and created fear and tension for the audience um, could have made them really, really great for the film, so it's a shame we never got any of that. So next up is for Catastrophic Quaken, which I think would have been awesome in the second movie in particular. Imagine this, we have a much more longer, um action sequence towards the middle of the film when of course you know we have valka's dragons going up uh, up against uh, drago's dragons and let's just say for a moment that valka's dragons are just wiping the floor with drago's army you know drago doesn't stand any of a chance he's uh, any chance of winning even he's on his last legs and then all of a sudden he brings in catastrophic quakens which just turn the tide of the battle devoid our heroes of hope as they are flown away from each other unable to reunite uh, and fall back to uh, conjure up some sort of strategy so overall the power and the fear these dragons could have created in the midst of battle and how it could have so easily taken away hope from our heroes as they are winning um due to their earthquakely uh, powers so to say could have just ultimately created a greater shift in emotions and a greater roller coaster of emotions from that action sequence itself. And next up, we have the Death Song, which could have been used by the Dragon Conquerors in the third movie to, of course, capture other dragons in the same way they're used in Race to the Edge as the Amber traps these dragons and makes it much more easier for uh, hunters to capture multiples of them at once. But this would have uh, came off as uh, a bit of a copycat considering that the hidden world came long after these uh, episodes of race to the edge did um so the fact that we would, would have seen that already just would have made us as the audience feel cheaped and um you know robbed of original content um and i suppose grimmel uh, could have easily salvaged this with his personality since he could have pointed out to the dragon conquerors about how cowardly this technique is and about how you know it takes out the hunt the fun of capturing these dragons so you know they could have easily fleshed out grimmel's character more with an interaction between him and the conquerors using these death songs so that's ultimately where the potential for this lands the fact that you know whilst the technique of using and Death Song Amber to capture dragons wouldn't be something original and therefore something that would have came off as generic and lazy for us as audience to see could have been used to um for writers benefit to of course flesh out Grimmel and make him a much more terrifying uh, villain as he uh, has a, res a lack of respect for everyone including his allies so that's what would have salvaged the death songs and could have made them a really great inclusion within how train dragon the hidden world now the snap trapper is a really awesome dragon and we never saw it in the movies i don't care how they would have implemented it i would have just wanted them to do it
So next up we have Night Terrors. Now these could have created a really high emotional punch when, of course, we see Toothless and the Light Fury in the hidden world as the other dragons pay their respects because we could have seen the Night Terrors take the shape of a Night Fury to, of course, honor Toothless and pay their respects to him. So that would have really allowed the feeling of pride and honor to settle in as we watched, um, you know, Toothless settle into the role that he was born to perform. His, you know kingshipness you could say and they could have also been really interested in the final battle against gremlins they could have taken up the a form of maybe a death gripper to scare off other dragons or you know taken up the form of once again a light fury um to show their loyalness to toothless so to say so either way no matter how you use the night terrors they could have um really stood out amongst the other dragons and created for even more detailed wide cinematic shots which could add so much more detail and glory to the film as a whole next up is for skrill so unfortunately toothless has never really had much of a direct arch enemy uh, in the films he's had plenty throughout the tv show with uh, for whispering death and and the Skrill itself, so reincorporating the Skrill into the Hidden World could have been something really cool to see. Now I know what you're thinking, Toothless did go against another dragon twice in the first and second movies, with uh, the Green Death and of course the um, Bewilder Beast, Drago's Bewilder Beast, and then of course he went against the Death Grippers, so Toothless going against other dragons isn't exactly something unique, but a direct personal arch enemy of Toothless would have been so cool to see, um, Especially when they're uh, going into a huge storm within their romantic flight for Light Fury and Toothless together and for Skrill showing up could have, uh, of course, um, emphasised Toothless's, uh, not Toothless's, Hiccup's um, craftsmanship in creating tail that would have, uh, you know, not have broken during the battle between Toothless and the Skrill and then not to mention Toothless would have been able to utilise his newfound powers and of course prove himself as a force to be reckoned with to the Light Fury which could have you know created better chemistry and sold our relationship much better to us as the audience so seeing a Skrill more specifically the one which uh, Toothless has a bit of a rivalry with once he goes into that lightning cloud uh, within the romantic flight of the third movie could have just been some really really cool to see a true grudge match between these two dragons just like the snap trapper for purple death and elder death have such great designs so once again i don't care how they're implemented just do it Next up is for Bone Napper. Now, I feel like this dragon would have been more fitting as Gobba's uh, pet rather than Grump was, despite the fact that Grump had an awesome design in of itself. But it was a little bit similar to the Gronagul, so a Bone Napper would have been more unique and, once again, could have created for more detailed cinematic shots because getting to see um, the Bone Napper again uh, in even greater detail than it was in its own respective short could have been glorious. But what's great about Bone Napper is that the short film has the same animation style and budget as for film so at least we got to see it with some really great texture and work and a really great amount of detail more so than the dragons which were exclusively um left for the tv shows so yes we did get a sheer amount of detail placed upon the bone napper in its own short but i still would have loved to see it in the films as uh, you know it could have created a for a really great relationship between itself and gobba and it would have also made uh, just as much sense as grump himself did so next up we have the armor wing dragons now these could have looked really really cool in the big bow sequence of the second movie especially uh with them decked out in drago blood uh, blood fists armor and then we get to see them as they of course you know launch uh, their armor at enemies um so that could have created some really great spectacle within the battle and added more um worried to the battle because we have you know really powerful dragons that can fire off their chunks of armor at you to create more fear and tension throughout the battle and it just would have made it an even greater spectacle than it was already with even greater detail and even greater cinematography so hey um a great quantity within that battle uh, would have created for great quality and that's where the armoring, armoring could have uh, came in to create greater quantity, greater fear with its own unique attack styles and it could have had some really unique aesthetics with some of Drago Bloodfist's armor having been placed upon it. Next up, 
we have Grim Nashes. Now, what I love about these dragons is that they have really awesome, terrifying designs, which could have easily been implemented to put as part of Grimmel's crew to create further tension um, and, of course, fear within the actual sequences involving uh, Grimmel's dragons. Since, of course, they fire off their teeth and can create infection and, you know, just some really horrid ways to die. So that could have added a lot of maturity uh, to the film as well. But I would have wanted to see them replaced for Death Grippers since those designs were definitely terrifying enough and definitely an extension of Grimmel's slimy, manipulative type um, personality. And, of course, they also had uh, for Venom which could be used on themselves uh, to uh, for Gribble to control them, mind you. So no matter how you spin it, for Death uh, for, for Grim Nashes never would have served as a great replacement upon the Death Grippers, because Death Grippers most certainly are better, but it could have definitely worked in combination with them to create a varied, terrifying crew of Grimmel, uh, and it would have also shown his resourcefulness, because he could have had different dragons for different situations, again, further fleshing out his character, and proven to us, the audience, his intelligence and his ability to react to situations to remain one step ahead of his opponents. So the final of these dozen dragons I wanted to see in the films would definitely be the Eruptodon. Now let's just say there was an active volcano right outside of Valka's nest that threatened the protection of all of the other dragons. Um, and yet the Eruptodon was there to eat the lava and prevent the volcano from, of course, erupting. Uh, that could have uh, showcased the protective um, instincts of the dragons, as one dragon can successfully protect an entire flock of them, which could have been really heartwarming, and uh, Valka definitely could have created some very interesting commentary on that, and it could have definitely emphasised her love uh, for dragons, and the dragons' love for her, because, of course, the Eruptodon would be protecting her as well as the other dragons of the nest um or it could have been uh, used to create even more fear and tension within the battle sequence of that same film let's say drago has an erupted on which having it decked out in drago's armor once again would have created for a really great aesthetic and some really great detail because i would have loved to see if erupted on with greater texture in uh, same situation here as for whisper and death but as i digress he could have used the erupted on on that active volcano right next um, to Valka's nest, if this was to be implemented, mind you, um, to of course cause it to erupt and finish off a battle much more quickly with lava coming in and of course uh, creating a great uh, threat towards our main heroes that uh, could have just swarmed us with even more fear and tension moving through the battle. So, you know, having a volcano erupt during the midst of that battle definitely would have made things more exciting and uh, cinematic, so to say. And the Erupted Dawn could have provided for either side of the spectrum, whether that was protection or fear. And these films are really great at balancing that and showing you the difference between dragons which have an instinct to protect and the dragons which have an instinct to kill. And the Erupted Dawn could have easily emphasised uh, all of that. So I'm going to end off this video with two bonus dragons, because why the heck not? Sign off with the Sliver Wing, which has a really terrible design. I don't like it very much. It is similar to that of Whisper and Death, with, of course, the thin-type body and the smaller wings. But unlike Whisper and Death, it wouldn't really mesh well with the other dragons, making wide cinematic shots more distracting than anything, because they stick out like a sore thumb. You could say that uh, you could say the same thing about my other honorable mention for Thunderdrome, since it has a very unique body shape that would stick out like a sore thumb and would stand out for all the wrong reasons, uh, just because it doesn't blend well with the other dragon designs. But these still would have been cool to see, at least by themselves, because with Sliver Wings, uh, their venom, of course, instantly, well, it doesn't instantly kill you, but its poison will kill you within a few hours. So if that, of course, fear of the venom, uh, and if Grimble could utilize that, could have made the sequences with him all the more terrifying and fear inducing because it would have been so easy for him to fire off one of those uh, poisonous arrows and uh, kill one of our main characters which of course that's why they didn't do that because it's far too overpowered of a weapon and would have hindered Grimmel's opportunity to use it because of course our characters have plot armor they cannot die as easy as a dart to the face with sling wing a uh, sliver wing venom uh, within it so I don't think uh, for the uh, for creators of the film wanted to hinder Grimmel's uh, hinder even Grimmel's ability to shoot 
a dragon or a main character with his darts, especially when it comes to the climax, where, of course, the Light Fury proves the arc she's been through by saving both Toothless and Hiccup. So with Silverwing Venom, you know, Toothless would have been hindered just fine, and the Light Fury never would have had to have saved Hiccup because Toothless would have been able to do it. So therefore, the uh, Grim, uh, for Death Grip is even definitely work a whole lot better in this context and as for the Thunder Drum, the main reason why that would work by itself is because maybe Stoic could see one and it would remind him of his old friend so he could have got a really emotional um, moment with Stoic, you know maybe even a really emotional interaction between him and Gobba as Stoic is reminded of his old friend and Gobba needs to be there to comfort him so to say um, so that could have been a really great way to tie the TV shows and the films together but unfortunately that just wasn't meant to be and it's really the only reason why I would want a Thunderdrome in the um, film, uh, in the films even. So that's why it's left as more of an honourable mention than all of the other dragons, which I absolutely would 100% love to have seen in the films, unlike the Thunderdrome, which is more of a 50-50 type thing. Whilst this is an incredible trilogy, there are some films which handle certain aspects better than others. You see this in just about any of the media you watch or you read, like take the Harry Potter uh, saga for example, there are certain books that do things better than the other books, such as maybe character development and all. And How to Train a Dragon is, of course, no different, with the exception that it's a film and not a book. Though, just like Harry Potter, it is a film series based on a book series. However, the film series is only loosely based on the books. There is very little book loyalty throughout the trilogy, and that just helped uh, establish it as its own creative entity, you could say. And How to Train a Dragon has its originality behind it uh, to thank for that. But uh, moving on from whether or not it's accurate to the books, which I may or may not have read, I still haven't read them yet, um, we're going to of course be starting off with the first movie, and what the first movie does best, and it has to be for writing and for structure, because the two sequels just can't compete with how well written and how well structured the first film is. Because what's so great about this structure is that it's traditional, and yet it breaks out of these traditional chains to twist the template and create something unique and distinctive with it because we have Hiccup going through the hero's journey in a way that's unique to him as a character. His character arc in that film is an embodiment of the film's themes and how the plot progresses more importantly and just Hiccup as a character because with this film the way it's structured with certain scenes uh, halfway through the exact middle of the film which is where the scene first fight takes place my favorite scene might i add there is a complete reversal where what happens is that we go through um the scenes leading up to the halfway point but in the reverse order and with the reverse themes happening. So in Test Drive, the very beginning of that scene, you know, it's rather quite chaotic. Hiccup and Toothless aren't really communicating with each other that well, and they're doing terrible in terms of their first flight. But then Hiccup throws away his cheat sheet, and all of a sudden they become synced, they become as one, and they start flying so gracefully and incredibly. And this is also, of course, where the score elevates to add to that excitement and truly deliver goosebumps. So the ordering of these scenes is what makes this structure so strong, because on top of that, um, with the first Hell Train Drag movie, there are two plots uh, taking place simultaneously. The A plot, which is, of course, Hiccup and Toothless, and their bond are growing as Hiccup is training Toothless. So says the uh, name of the movie, How to Train Your Dragon. And everything he learns from training Toothless through the A plot is um, applied to the B plot. So take the instance where um, Hiccup learns that Toothless chases the little beam of light um, on the floor created by his shield like a cat would, uh, because dragons have that same instinct, I suppose. And then he incorporates that technique in the B plot with the teenagers in the arena to, of course, um, tame the terrible terror. And the same is done when Hiccup learns that dragons are afraid of eels through Toothless. He utilizes the eel to, once again, tame the Zippleback. Everything that happens in the A plot advances the B plot in some way. And that's a very 
a awesome structure for a film to tackle that plays it safe while still at the same time allowing that uniqueness to shine through. And the greatest structure in this story is the dynamic between Hiccup and Stoic and how it slowly but surely um, uh, escalates as such, you know. At first, Stoic is shamed by Hiccup and wishes he was one of the big, more stronger Vikings, and then when he, of course, um, misinterprets Hiccup's skills, and whilst he certainly does have skills, but it's in dragon training and not in dragon killing, of course, Stoic shuns him for this because he is so different, but then he learns the errors of his ways about how Hiccup's difference has effectively saved the tribe from a giant killer green death and that Hiccup has his own chief in that's unique to him that's far different to Stoic's and so this theme of change as Stoic goes through that change that's brought about by the steady structuring and pacing of the story is ultimately what makes this um, arc work so well and it's what makes the dynamic between these two characters as it grows stronger and stronger so powerful uh, on screen. And so above all, the first film has some incredible structure within its writing. It takes the source material and it runs it through traditional movie templates, but twisting it just enough so it has that unique and distinctive flavour to it. And that alone is clever, you know, the fact that it can take a template and not be derivative of other films in the slightest but now I move on to the second movie, which easily has the greatest relationship um, development and raw emotion brought about by said relationships, because of course we have the reintroduction of Valka, and so they are able to capture such grand emotion when Stoic and Valka reunite, because once again it reinforces the themes of change, as Valka is expecting one thing from Stoic, but due to his character arc from that first movie and him maintaining that change, Valka receive something entirely unexpected and because of that their reunion becomes so powerful as you can see what Stoic has gone through to get him here and then of course afterwards, uh, sh uh, shortly afterwards the more specific commences the last scene that the family have together of course Stoic and Valka have their dance and at first uh, Valka doesn't join in with the song because she still has that guilt and doesn't feel like she could be part of the family again after the mistakes she's made. But then she starts to put all of that behind her because she realises that all that matters in that moment is that Hiccup and Stoic still love her and have forgiven her for what she's done in the past. And so naturally she starts singing along with Stoic and the scene. Uh, rapidly becomes more fast paced and upbeat and so that roller coaster of emotions going from the sadness to the sheer and utter joy and then the added context knowing that this is their last scene that they shared together before Stoic's death which in and of itself is highly emotional because it's so dark and it takes such great risks that I can't help but respect it and cry at it every single time because it's not only used as a way to stir up emotion due to a character's death, but due to the reaction of that death. Because here's the thing, a death itself really isn't all that emotional. A character dies and you just think, so what, they're fictional anyways. But when the other characters react to that death, that's what stirs up the true emotion. And of course, Hiccup's speech is he's he's distraught, he's devastated. He no longer believes in, in, in himself the way he used to. And it takes Valka finally stepping up into that motherly role to give Hiccup that confidence boost he needs and this is a way of both of them through Stoic's death not allowing him to die in vain as they grow in their characters and that's also just so full of raw emotion thanks to how strong these relationships are set up and developed thoroughly throughout this film. I've never seen it better, I might have been praising it in the first movie but the second film takes everything that the first film um, did a great about for relationships and it ups it. But moving on to the hidden world, what this film easily has going for it is theming, which is going to be an entire video in it of itself uh, coming up next year, hopefully, alongside my Every Dragon Species rank that I have also promised. But enough of self uh, promotions, we're going to talk briefly 
about why the theme in the world is so good and so much more better than the first two movies because the theme here first of all is up to interpretation and that's what's so great about it the fact that different viewers can take different things from a film i originally felt as though the film was all about independence and it most certainly is for the joyant character arc of all of our riders as they learn teamwork and independence from their dragons um, and that alone is a very mature message to show you that you don't need training reels in life and that soon in life you're going to lose them so you need to be able to stand on your own two feet at points and so this is an excellent way to prepare her children for how harsh the world is growing up and that's where our next theme comes in the next theme is a theme of love which is cringy when I put it like that but growing up has such an, a crucial element incorporated into this theme because as you grow up you have to of course um, give up the things that you love because to truly love means to let go to let the people you love move on with their lives so that then they can have the success that they are longing for or the safety that they need and that's exactly what happens at the end of the hidden world the dragons are sent off not because it's what the Vikings want, but it's because the Vikings know that's what the dragons need. And so that theme of love and about how Hiccup and Toothless's bond represent what's hard in love. What's hard is to let go. And then Grimmel represents the complete contrast as a villain should, as he's represented what is easy for Hiccup to blindly hold on to Toothless and refuse to let him go. And that's ultimately what gets Toothless captured, but Grimmel's undoing is his misunderstanding of Hiccup and how he is m more than willing to set free what he loves as an expression of that love. And all of these things in combination with one another are not only well written, but it has such a strong semblance of theme throughout that the film's message lingers in your mind long after the credits roll and so the fact that the hidden world is able to achieve such maturity without the levels of darkness in its tone that the second film had is ultimately what makes the hidden world the greatest of the how train dragon trilogy at theming if those of you are new to the channel it's very important that you know a very key thing about me and that is my passion my love behind this franchise so the answer as to whether i think these films are modern classics comes easy to me yes of course i think they are but we're going to break that down slightly further and talk about you know why outside of my personal opinion outside of my bias objectively these are the makings of modern classic films now first of all all film studios need some sort of modern classics to call their own, you know, they need some sort of repertoire, if you will, just something iconic that encapsulates their company, you know, the peak of their content, you could go, you could go as far to say, now DreamWorks has several candidates, you know, several franchises of theirs, which could encapsulate the very best of what they've made, those franchises could range from Kung Fu Panda to Madagascar to Shrek, but personally, none of these franchises are as consistent or as high in quality as the How Train Your Dragon series. So right off the bat, How Train Your Dragon is DreamWorks' masterpiece. So we already have the fact that this is a studio's high point to help push these modern classic um, titles for these films, shall we say. You can tell it is unscripted with all of the ums. Don't take a shot for every single time you say um, otherwise you're going to be, you know, so called dead half an hour into this video because I could talk that long without her dragon like you. But getting back on topic, um, DreamWorks Studios have of course provided several animated films and the How Train Dragon trilogy is no exception to that. All three films are animated, which begs the question, will the animation ever become dated? I'm worried about that for the first film because the first film does have a lot of texturing issues. And not only am I the only one excited to talk about How Train Dragon right now, as is my laptop, you can hear its fans running in the background, got to cool itself down from all this excitement. But regardless of all that, yes, the first film 
does have a lot of texturing issues with the animations and some of the movements can look a little jank and not the most fluent and on top of that it's abundantly clear that they needed to hide certain characters from certain frames because if they had too many characters and too many dragons in a single frame at once it crashed the program so it's abundantly clear the limitations of the software and the fact that you just don't have huge dragon armies that we come to expect from the two sequels mind you so elements of the first film definitely are going to start getting more and more dated in terms of the animation but it still looks crisp it's nice and it's colorful too so it's never going to look terrible far from it in fact because it still has such a huge amount of detail especially put to things like dragon scales how their fires react the physics behind them all and the fact that each dragon has their own unique fire breaths you know looking at a gronagle and then comparing that juxtaposition to the monstrous nightmare just how differently the flame breaths react is incredible in and of itself it's visually dazzling stuff i'm describing to all of you but then for two sequel films that animation is never going to become dated because we are only a few years away from being able to make animation look as though it's live action the soul has shots in it that look like it's live action and here's the thing with animation you know it's a cartoon you're going through all this work and effort to animate something so when it gets to the point of animation being able to replicate real life and looking aesthetically so good that it is live action where's the point in animating your film at that point if there's you know it's just as soon as animation has that live action type of quality to it it's no longer worth animating that project because you might as well just go out and shoot it because shooting films using real life assets is quicker and less uh, money consuming than what animating stuff is because when you're animating something everything is just in a digital player and it needs to be built up with assets from scratch However, if you live, so if you film something live, like let's just take this Cinder character I have right here. I have this physically; it's in my hand, so naturally I can just film it right in front of you guys. But if I had to animate this, whoop, all of a sudden it's no longer there, and I need to animate that entire asset into my hand right here, or just have my hand sitting here awkwardly, which is exactly what I'm going to do because I cannot animate. But you guys get my point. Animation is hard time consuming and very expensive so if it gets to a point where it's looking live action there's no longer any point in even animating a project so with that being said and done how to train your dragon two sequels in particular have that fine balance between looking almost live action like and still having that cartoon aesthetic the characters and the dragons have such imagination creativity and colours and contrast to make the thing look gorgeous but then the backgrounds are almost live action the caves and the hidden world look so fantastic it looks like they just took some cameras down to some caves and filmed it and animated some dragons in the mix which they didn't do but the animation just so happens to look as good as that so yes i don't think the animation is going to become dated just because it draws that fine line between live action and cartoon based aesthetics and you don't get much more better than that in terms of how good you can get cgi to look so the animation is going to become any time uh, dated anytime soon but the next problem as to what makes films dated and aged is for material whether it you know references modern pop culture because if you have stuff referencing modern pop culture when of course that pop culture goes out of fashion and people don't really resonate and identify that pop culture anymore then whenever a film brings up that pop culture all of a sudden you are reminded of the fact that this film was made years and years ago and that it was made within that set time period and that you know it can no longer have that same impact in modern day because modern day doesn't have that same pop culture um, behind it and fortunately for us, based on the time period of the How to Train Dragon films, the fact that they take place during the Viking era, they never can get dated due to pop culture references because they don't make any. Which is really, really cool. And that's why period dramas are some of the only films that will never, ever become dated because the time period in which they're set don't have any pop culture to make reference of. 
it's why films like Ready Player One are going to become so dated a few decades from now because they are so based around our modern pop culture. And so naturally How to Train Dragon doesn't have any content that's going to make it um, age. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The main reason why films become classics is because they speak of universal themes that all audiences can relate to no matter of what time they're currently living in. Themes that will live on through humanity because they symbolise humanity themselves. And that's exactly what the How to Train Your Dragon films explore. They explore themes of independence as well as teamwork that direct just position and everything it's very sharp and emotionally resonating in these themes as well as themes of family unity bondage you know putting aside your prejudices i'm pretty sure that's a word and so naturally because these themes live within humanity themselves, no matter what time it is, it could be 2130, human beings will still have that need for bondage, teamwork, independence. So those themes will still live on in those humans several years from now, meaning that these films just really can't age you to overall how amazing their quality is. They speak of universal themes that summarize humanity themselves, they are absolute iconic hidden gems from the studio that created them, the peak of that studio's content creation, you could go as far to say. They don't have anything um, modern based in it that can become dated a few years from now because of the fact that, you know, there's nothing that old, uh, that audiences several years from now are going to resonate with any less than what we do in this current day and age. So that's what makes the How to Train Your Dragon trilogy modern classics. They are important films and showcase the power of animation and about how animation can be used as a tool to deliver powerful, emotionally rich stories that both kids and adults can love because How to Train Your Dragon is one of those series to where I'm almost 20 now and I still love these films. And I loved these films when I first, first saw them in cinemas over 10 years ago. Yes, these How to Train Dragon films stand for something special. They are incredible in terms of their overall quality. I've mentioned time and time again how good the writing, character development and theme exploration in these films are. Some of them are even as close to perfection as one can get and so with all of this information having been summarised off script, mind you, I think I did a pretty good job if you were to ask me. Then again, of course, I'd say that this is my own uh, discussion video we're talking about here. But regardless of all that, with the answer, with the question even, having been answered, are the How to Train Dragon films modern classics? Heck, yes, they are. I cannot, in good conscience, end off this video without first thanking all of my incredible channel members whose continued support helped make these videos possible. Without them, these videos would be near impossible to make, so from the bottom of my heart, I truly appreciate every last one of them. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, there are plenty of options on screen now to explore, and please consider subscribing to keep up to date with all my content. On that note, this video is coming to an end, so thank you so much as always for watching. Until the next video arises, Peace.